Hello, and welcome to Direct Approach with Wayne Moorhead, an exclusive podcast by Direct Selling News, where Wayne interviews today's leading corporate executives, innovators, and thought leaders within and around direct selling. Each episode aims to provide timely insights, fresh perspectives, and relevant takeaways to help grow and evolve your businesses. In today's episode, host Wayne is joined by John T. Fleming, a true legend in the direct selling industry and author of the book, Ultimate Gig, Flexibility, Freedom, and Rewards. With more than 50 years of experience in the direct selling industry, John remains not only one of profession's most trusted experts, but one of its strongest advocates. With his new book, he looks at the rise of the gig economy, what independent contractors are looking for, and how that is changing what companies must do to attract and retain this new generation of workers. The insight he brings to this timely, trailblazing book provides an unprecedented look inside the growing gig economy and how it is transforming every aspect of our world and giving rise to a new kind of entrepreneur. Based on in-depth research and true stories of today's gig workers, it looks at how people from all walks of life are finding new ways to work as independent contractors and how they are leveraging their passions to find success. And he shares why he believes direct selling is poised to become the ultimate gig. John is uniquely qualified to examine the role direct selling plays in the gig economy. He was publisher and editor-in-chief of Direct Selling News from 2006 through 2015 and held a variety of executive positions with Avon before that. John's list of accolades and accomplishments are many. He joined the Direct Selling Education Foundation Circle of Honor in 1997. He was inducted into the Direct Selling Association Hall of Fame in 2016 and was the first recipient of the Direct Selling News Lifetime Achievement Award, and just last year in 2021, was honored in the inaugural group of Direct Selling Legends presented by DSN, recognizing individuals with 50 or more years of active service in the channel. This interview is a rare opportunity to look at the intersection of the gig economy and direct selling and to better understand the role of trust in this new economy why women play such an important role in it, and how the drivers behind choosing a career in the gig economy have changed. I recommend you open up your notes app because this episode is loaded with insights and statistics you'll definitely want to be able to jot down. One of the many contributors to the rise of the gig economy is technology. And on that note, we want to invite you to join us for the very first live broadcast Tech Summit event for direct selling CIOs, CTOs, and teams that happens next Tuesday, February 22nd, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. We are so excited to welcome several notable industry leaders and subject matter experts to the conversation, including executives from Red Aspen, Pure Romance, Inclara Group, which supports IT security for Amazon and AT&T, former Amway, Squire, Exigo, Now Technologies, and more, all sharing their experiences and learnings on everything from how to build customer trust through proper data security and privacy, when to buy and when to build, managing your technology portfolio and staffing for the different seasons of your company's life, cutting edge tech on a budget, all things ERP and more. The event is free to all active corporate direct selling executives. Join us and save your spot today. Register at directsellingnews.com forward slash tech summit. And we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Exigo, for helping make this event 100% free of charge for active executives. In an industry that demands adaptability, Exigo delivers unrivaled access to the data that drives your business, from CRM to transactions to commissions. Flexible, scalable, and powerful, with Exigo, the possibilities are unlimited. Learn more at exigo.com. That is E-X-I-G-O dot com. And now, please help me welcome your host, Wayne Moorhead, and today's guest, John T. Fleming, direct selling legend and author of The Ultimate Gig, Flexibility, Freedom, and Rewards. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DSN's Direct Approach Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Moorhead, and I am honored today to be joined by an absolute legend, He is in the Direct Selling Association Hall of Fame. 
He's received Direct Selling News' uh, Lifetime Achiever Award. He's in the Circle of Honor from Direct Selling Education Foundation. He was also on the board of the Direct Selling Education Foundation. He was the publisher and editor in chief of Direct Selling News for many years and helped really make that become the source for information within the Direct Selling channel. He's also been an exec at one of the largest direct selling companies in the world and so much more. John, welcome to Direct Approach and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Wayne, for the invitation. And I'm honored to be a part of your podcast. I have been listening and you've had so many great guests. So for you to invite me to be a part of this and the DSN brand, I'm just delighted. So uh, happy to be here today. Oh, I appreciate that and really appreciate your time. John, you've had such a huge impact uh, on direct selling, really at every level, at the channel level, with all of your work at Direct Selling News and uh, the DSA, at the company level, um, not only inside as an exec, but also as a board member, as an advisor to so many companies in the channel. And even at the individual level, you, you've gotten to know and help so many people over the years, including myself. And I just want to thank you for being such an incredible mentor and example to me over the years. I've been so impressed and touch with how free you are in giving with your time, um, with your advice, with your counsel. Anytime I was in Dallas, I knew I could swing by the the DSN office and knock on your door and, and would always get welcomed in. So thank you so much for, again, for all you've done for direct selling and for me as well, personally. A pleasure. Well, for the past few years, John, you've been doing some really interesting work. You've been researching and writing um, what I feel is one of the most comprehensive and definitive works on the gig economy. And we're going to spend today kind of digging into that, some of the, the really interesting implications and ideas for direct selling. But before we jump into the main topic um, and your book, can you just take a few minutes and share with us the path that led you into direct selling? Because it's it's a really interesting story. Uh, I'd love to learn more. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Wayne. And it takes me back about four years when I started what I call the Ultimate Gig Project. And at that time, I knew that I needed to pay attention to what was going on in terms of the growth of the gig economy. Now, I'm a passionate advocate of the direct selling channel, and I think you know that, and I spent most of my life uh, as a direct seller and as an executive within a company, and then the great years as publisher, editor-in-chief of Direct Selling News. So when I stepped away from direct selling news to kind of rethink my focus, what do I do next? I really started to pay attention to the gig economy because I was so impressed with the fact that people from all walks of life were being attracted. Gigs were showing up in different forms. And when I looked at the stats and facts related to our channel, the direct selling channel, the facts are that beginning in 2015, the channel started to shrink overall, domestically and globally, in terms of revenue. And if you look at the DSA record there and the reports that they put out each year, that be- became uh, important for me to understand. And more important, I thought it was the opportunity to understand better what was happening in the gig economy. And that's when I said, okay, I know what my next step is. I need to read, study, do some research and better understand this new phenomenon that is capturing the attention in mature markets all over the world. And so that led me to the beginning of the research. And Wayne, I had probably read and studied more in the past four years than any other single period in my life, including the formal educational years. And so what I found was we have something that is growing in many different forms as a result of technology and as a result of many business channels looking to reduce complexity and emerge with simplified business models that use people 
as the intermediaries to connect consumers with products and services. Now, that sounds like direct selling, but it is what's behind the gig economy. And there are many labels out there, and I'll just take a, a, a couple of minutes to clarify some of these labels. You might hear sharing economy, peer economy, on-demand economy, platform economy, network economy, bottom-up economy, access economy, rental economy, informal economy. All of these are subsets of what I see now as this new emerging gig economy. And direct selling is, of course, a part of this. Many people think of the gig economy as just transportation gigs. It's much bigger than that. The largest individual segment within the gig economy is not transportation gigs. It happens to be freelancers, full of professionals, educators, people that have talent, skills that they want to market to the world. Uh, not to mention in their own communities, utilizing technology in the form of digital platforms. So the main four categories of gigs are transportation gigs, service gigs, selling gigs, and leasing gigs. Now, we all know that Uber and Lyft and uh, all of the transportation gigs fall in that particular category. Service gigs, TaskRabbit others that bring you a service that you don't have that allows you to fix something that you need to be fixed. Selling gigs. This is where direct selling fits, but this is also where Etsy happens to be, a global mall where you can go and shop and purchase pretty much uh, any type of good that you would like. I purchase a lot through Etsy because all of the products that Etsy puts into their platform are created by independent contractors. So the are micro entrepreneurs that have found a way through this marvelous digital platform to sell their, their products. And then you have companies emerging to support the selling sector of the gig economy, companies like Shopify that make it very easy for you or I if we have a hobby or something to sell or a brand that we want to represent that allows it to be able to create a digital platform and a presence and all of a sudden be out there as a credible business. Shopify, by the way, has grown enormously. I won't get into their revenue numbers, but they're huge. Uh, they're almost 2 billion. I think they will report over 2 billion for 2021. Policing gigs, everybody is familiar with that. That's where Airbnb falls. And Airbnb allows us to lease an underutilized space or asset, be it the room in the home or a home itself or property or what have you. And Airbnb, you know, is huge. And hoteliers are paying attention because people from all walks of life can participate in Airbnb. So that's a little description of the gig economy. And I can give you uh, a few more stats and facts as we go along, but hopefully that defines it for you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, this kind of gig economy, you know, that terminology, that idea has been a huge part of the zeitgeist over the last you know, several years. And it really represents one of the biggest shifts, I think, over the past several decades, because it's not only impacting how we work, you know, all of the different categories that you just mentioned, but also how we live, where we live, and so much more. What, what do you feel are, are some of those key drivers behind the rise of the gig economy? Why it's really coming to fruition today, you know, not 10 years from now or 10 years ago? What are, what are some of these key drivers that have really brought it to the forefront? Well, I think there are quite a few, quite frankly. Uh, and just to put, put size uh, into this conversation, the gig economy is approaching 60 million Americans involved. Uh, that's about nine times the size of uh, what we report for the direct selling network marketing mm -hmm. industry. So that's why we should pay attention. A lot of people are paying attention and a lot of people are getting involved. And the revenue 
or the economic impact is estimated to be about 1.4 trillion. Now, there's some reasons for this, and I think it's uh, it's an inflection point for our society in many ways, because people are realizing that the traditional way of working, the traditional job, if you will, is not necessarily providing everything that one wants for themselves, their families. And we did uh, some tracking of wage increases, hourly wage increases. And we found that if we go back to 1960, 40 years, the hourly wage has actually increased tremendously. And the graph goes straight up. I mean, it's a very nice increase. But then when we track purchasing power, the graph is a straight flat line for the most part. And what does that mean? It means that the house that we used to purchase for 50,000 now costs 150 to 200,000. And even though wages have increased, purchasing power has not. So people are looking beyond traditional forms of work to better leverage underutilized time, assets, knowledge, skills. That's where the gig economy comes into play. That's where direct selling comes into play. The gig economy probably uh, takes it a bit further in that it delivers a realistic promise. The gig economy is not about a career change. The gig economy is about testing yourself to see what you would like to do what you can do. It doesn't take a whole lot of knowledge and skill to become a part of the transportation sector. Shopify is making it very easy to become a part of the selling sector. All of it is a new way to embrace micro enterprise. And that's what the gig economy is doing. And we found that the sweet spot is a promise of about $500 to $1,500 per month in income, not a career change, not an opportunity to earn six figures or you know, live a very different lifestyle. It's about supporting you where you are so that you can utilize, underutilized time primarily. And then we put in underutilized assets, knowledge, skill can be an asset. So that's a marvelous thing. And I think behind the motivation to look at this this gig economy are also stats and facts. And when we looked at the savings rate amongst Americans across the country, we found 40 some percent in the category of 35 to 44 had virtually zero savings. And then when we looked at the average savings account below 1,000, we found another 20-some percent. Wayne, that's a huge segment of the population. So when we are attempting to appeal to this huge segment that obviously has a need, the simplicity of the gig economy is answering that need. That's the way we see it. That was part of the motivation for writing the book. And that's why I dedicated the last three and a half, four years to this particular subject to hopefully help others as well better understand what's going on here so that we can (laughs) bring that understanding into our channel and look at a way of extending opportunity to people that can be bigger, better, more beautiful, more sustainable than perhaps ever before. That was really incredible information. And I want to circle back on, on a few of the things that you just said. I was kind of taking notes frantically here. And, and you talked about, you know, one of the key drivers being around purchasing power and also kind of a reduction in savings. And while wages have gone up, you know, considerably you know, over the last three, four decades, it's also interesting to note that the minimum wage didn't rise for about 13 years. Yeah. Right. So, so even while you know purchasing power was decreasing, that for that subsegment, earnings stayed completely flat. So their earning power was even less. Yeah. But that I think coupled with the need for um, 
or, or I should say with, with no or, or very little savings, it's interesting. What, what kind of came to mind for me was that it, it has really kind of changed what we offer in direct selling, the potential to, you know, earn additional income, you know, at many levels. It's really kind of shifted it from a want to a need. You know, it, it used to be pitched, you know, in companies long ago when I got into to direct selling that you could save for that vacation, you know, help have some extra money for car payments and college tuition and all these other things. But now I think to a certain group of people, it's it's really just to pay the bills. They're, they're not they're not getting the the income or the purchasing power that they normally would. And so I think that there's even a greater need for some of the value that we offer to, to certain groups of people, for sure. Yeah, and we conducted our own research uh, in the writing of the book, and I was uh, fortunate to uh, have in my circle of friends, Dr. Robert A. Peterson over, over at the University of Texas, who led this research. And so we wanted to dig deeper into motivations. And what we found was exactly what you just said. The great majority of the people working gigs want to pay the bills. And it ties back to a basic fact of life. No matter what we earn, if we spend more than what we earn, we have a problem. And so we can be earning six figures or we can be earning five figures. And if we are spending more, which is easy to do in this society, we have a problem. And when we ask the participants in our survey for their reasons for working a gig, the answer was clear. It was to pay the bills, but also in conjunction with that was to save more and invest more. So those two things go hand in hand because people have a tendency to want to feel secure. So wanting to save and invest more never leaves the equation. So it is to pay the bills, but we don't have a lot of motivation just to work to pay a bill. The motivation kicks in when we can pay the bills to free up more money to save and invest more. So those two things go hand in hand, and you're exactly right. That's the big motivation that's attracting a lot of people to the gig economy in particular. Oh, that's interesting. So you also mentioned that a lot of these companies that are participating in, in the gig economy make a very realistic promise. And in your research, for me, one of the most incredible statistics was that 97% of people that are participating in the gig economy said that they were satisfied, which to me is an incredible. Like if you were to look at that as an NPS score um, at a consumer products company, I mean, that would be absolutely off the charts. But that that research that you did, bringing that 97% satisfied, to me also boils down to, I mean, you said realistic promise, but it also means that expectations are being met, that there is this balance between kind of the price value equation. And I think as it relates to direct selling, there's a, there's a great lesson for all of us to learn. We all know that historically, you know, one of the criticisms of direct selling has been that a lot of the focus from the marketing and the messaging uh, really centers on the earnings potential at the higher ranks. And so if that's the focus for a company, then there is a pretty significant chance that expectations of people entering aren't going to be met. But as you talked about this, the sweet spot of being, you know, $500 to $1,500 per month that's that's super realistic. That is definitely a promise that I think all of our companies can deliver on. And I think it's also, a, I mean, it's been a conversation internally at all of our companies. We've all had this conversation of how do we help get the message out that earning an extra 500, 1,000, you know, as you mentioned, even $1,500 a month is significant. I mean, it, it is life-changing for so many of us to have that additional amount of income. How do we help focus back down on maybe some of the earning potential at the lower ranks so that we're really meeting the expectation. It doesn't mean that that potential is not there, but it seems like the center of gravity or the pendulum always ends up swinging, whether it's from the corporate side or the field side, back to the earning potential at the higher ranks. How do we help to make sure that we're leaving more people satisfied 
And I think part of it is focusing on that sweet spot. What are your thoughts around that? Well, my thoughts are many. And behind what you just said, there are many things to focus on. And when we did the survey, uh, one of the questions was, what did you expect to earn? And so there are a lot of people, 100 to 200, two to three, four to five. And we picked five as being the beginning of a sweet spot simply because it's aspirational and it's so measurable. I mean, when you bring in an incremental five, you you know something is happening. And but achievable. I mean, realistically, yeah, that's achievable. Yeah, it, It's achievable. And it's worth my time to go and try. Here are a couple of things I want to mention about that. We ask questions, what did you expect to earn? And then we ask questions, what did you earn? And the match was almost identical. So that's why we say... Wow outcomes really match expectations. And that's why you have a high satisfaction rate. Now, the satisfaction rate is broken into subsegments of satisfied, very satisfied. Uh, I think we may have had one other. And then we had dissatisfied. The 3% is the group that said, I was dissatisfied. So that's how we get to 97. 97 were not highly or very, but from satisfied up, it totaled 97. That's extraordinary. And that's, that's incredible. To say the outcome matched the expectation. Now, when we think about what we can do to attract more of these individuals, I think it's just being realistic. I think it's being thirsty for understanding. And that's why we wrote the book. In the book, we, we, we offer a lot of stats and facts. It's not a motivational book. It's not a self-help book. Uh, don't provide any answers in that book. The book is designed to be thought-provoking because it presents you with a broad look at the gig economy. And also, it's obvious when you read the book that I have a bias toward direct selling. But when I named the book Ultimate Gig, I didn't pick an ultimate gig. I think direct selling could be the ultimate <laughs> gig if we identify better with this great growing segment of the marketplace that is looking for realistic ways to try something to determine if they can do it and the outcome being incremental income. Now, in our channel, we put a lot of focus on rank achievement. We don't find rank achievement in the gig economy. We find an interest in opportunity. We find an interest in testing whether you think you might like to do this. So people have a safe ground to try new things. In the gig economy, turnover is not measured the way we measure it. In the gig economy, if you don't like it, move on to something else and try something else. Now, when we first did our research in July, August of 2020, 55% of the participants were working multiple gigs. When we did that research again in October 2021, the segment of people working multiple gigs had grown from 55 to 69%. Now that means that people are becoming more micro entrepreneurial. They're realizing that their underutilized time, which is their biggest underutilized asset, could be used many different ways. So I think as we look to the future, we have to understand that when people come to us, we might not be the only thing that they do. And I'm very conscious of the fact that that's a very sensitive comment in our model because we tend to want to think that when they come, we want them to be here and then we'll cultivate them and build them into becoming perhaps a leader and building a great team of people. Well, that concept still works, but many people are looking for flexibility and freedom. That's why our tagline is people are looking for flexibility, freedom, and rewards. Yeah, you, you can't provide the first two without 
providing an exciting reward. So that's how I think about that. And I think that the onus is on us to become more studious, to really look at the marketplace and not just our own channel of distribution in terms of how we grow into this magnificent future. Absolutely. That, that is a really important concept, I think, for, for all of us in direct selling to understand. You're right. There used to be an expectation, even if implied, that once a distributor reached certain ranks, that they would be all in, that they would focus on this opportunity 100% and even potentially leave their job once they reached kind of, you know, they were, they were able to replace the full-time income of a job. But I think we do need to understand, as your research shows, that 70% of these people are going to be doing something else as well, whether it's a full-time job, one to few to maybe even several other quote unquote gigs um, within this new working framework. And so we can't expect them to dedicate 100% of their time to us. So I I think from um, how we talk to them, how we engage with them, um, even contracts that we develop as companies at the higher ranks, we need to understand that they're going to have other opportunities and they're they're going to be engaged in, in other forms of the gig economy. And we can't expect them to, you know, we can't force them into the way we do business. We really need to be able to meet them where they're at to, again, help to to increase that satisfaction level. Another thing you talked about was time. I think that that also gets to the nature of competition and how this gig economy has really shifted the nature of competition for us in direct selling. We've always understood that we don't compete, you know, on shelf or directly with each other within the channel. And the good part of that is it's led to a lot of collaboration and a lot of sharing. Um, And that's one of the things I absolutely love most about the direct selling channel. But really, instead of going for kind of share of wallet, like we used to be, we're now competing more for share of time. There are so many options out there in the gig economy that we need to work even harder to make sure that we are a preferred option, a viable option, um, for them within the gig economy. What are your thoughts on how, how this has kind of changed competition and, and how we need to be looking at the whole gig economy as it relates to who's in the competitive set? You know, what are we, who are we really going up against? Well, I think we're going up against uh, the new way we work. And a hot topic in HR circles is the future work. And the future work will be different from the way we have worked in the past. It's gonna allow for more flexibility, more freedom, and the independent contractor micro entrepreneur is going to have more leverage. So I think as we look forward, uh, the competition is not another direct selling network marketing company. Uh, The DSA lists about 200, and I can tell you that there are more than 2000 different types of gig opportunities available for you to represent a product or service, to become an intermediary, or to become a brand influencer. And there's a new language out there. It's it's not the language of the direct selling network marketing uh, model. And I think the future is going to uh, be more about being relevant. And we have to be relevant in the bigger sphere of things, not just focused on who else is doing this or who else has the shiny new this or that. And a lot of great work is being done, Wayne, by a lot of our companies. And I won't get into, uh, you know, mentioning brands specifically, but that keeps me excited. And when I look at some of the transformation that has become obvious, I mean, you see it. That's what the future is all about. It's becoming relevant. And here's the one thing that we can do that Amazon cannot do. If I get off of this call and I decide that there's something that I really need that I forgot about, and I find it on Amazon, chances are I'm going to get it tomorrow if not the next day. So Amazon has an excellent service 
where we can access the products that we need. The difference with what we do and the way we do it is that we add personality. We add personalization. We add emotion. We add passion. We let people know our story and why we use these products, why we engage this opportunity. And when we bring that into play, that's something that Amazon cannot do. And that's the future for us. Now, what will the label be five years from now? I'm not quite sure. And I don't think I'm concerned. I'm more concerned about our channel maturing and becoming more relevant than maybe ever, ever before because we're clearly understood by a marketplace that's bigger than ever, ever before. Wayne, you know I've been involved with this channel for a long time. DSN recognized me in the legends category. And when I agreed to facilitate that project or help with it, the first thing I wanted to do was remove myself. It, you know, I can't be in that category. That's a long time. You're talking about being involved 50 some years with a channel of distribution. Well, that happens to be me. And I can say in my 50 some years, I've never seen the marketplace more favorable to what we do as long as we focus on being relevant to that marketplace because it has changed. Bigger, better, more exciting than ever before. Absolutely. I do think that this rise of the gig economy plays so much to the strengths in our channel that, that you outlined and use the analogy of uh, the things that we offer, the value we provide, you know, differently than, than Amazon and, and other uh, e-commerce or direct retailers. I think another thing that we bring to the table is, is really trust. So many of us now are uh, leery of the news that we hear, or we're not as trusting of company messaging or, you know, other institutional messaging. And we're really looking to our peer set, our friends, our families, those in, in kind of our, our relational circle of influence to know what products to trust, to buy, that they enjoy. And I think that plays so much into our advantages, that personal nature, as you mentioned, the customizable nature of it, but really the trust of peers where I'm going to listen to, to what they say more so than, than a lot of institutional messaging from the past. And I also think it is a really exciting time. You know, in some ways, I think we were or considered ourselves the original gig you know, over the last hundred years, it really, we really were one of the most viable options out there to really get plugged into additional streams of income, to sharing products at a very low entry point, at a very low cost to the distributor. And I think all these people coming into the gig economy really helped to, to normalize, um, to make common in a good way, in a very positive way the selling, the sharing, all of these gig opportunities, I think it does nothing but but really play in our favor. One of the things that your research showed was the, one of the key drivers was really technology. And I know that this is, this is something that you really dug deep on. It's one of the foundational elements of the gig economy. Can you talk a little bit about this, the role that technology plays? You talk about how kind of work from home has shifted to work from phone. I, I'd love for you to elaborate a little bit on kind of the technology driver and needs in this new economy. Wayne, thanks for that. And, and I'd like to go back to trust and then I'm going to move quickly to yeah, please. Uh, technology um, from this perspective. Trust is something that we've always capitalized on. Now, when it is evident, it's wonderful. You can't replace it. We have to also look back at the stories we tell and the opportunities we present to make sure that our trust resonates and we do not overpromise in anything that we do. That's very important. In chapter one of the book, I talk about the fact that trust is one of the key components of the gig economy. 
And it comes into play in almost everything about the gig economy. And you just think about this. Technology allows us to pull up an app, connect with a service that connects us with a driver that then allows us to know where he or she is, how long it's going to be before we get there, before they get there, and how long it's going to take them to take us where we want to go. Now, we trust that that relationship is going to work out fine. The car may be new or not so new. We do not know the driver. It will not have any big signage on it. We do not know all of the certifications that they went through, which we know are minimal in comparison to limo drivers and taxi cab drivers of the past. But this new way of transportation has disrupted the old way. And we no longer mm -hmm. see the taxi cabs on the street. Trust, Airbnb, trust. You stay in someone's home. You don't know who they are. They may cook you the breakfast. You don't know what they are putting into it, but it's trust that leads us in that direction. Trust is what leads us into selling gigs. Trust is what leads us into service gigs. The task rabbit comes, says that he knows how to fix the plumbing. You trust that they can be able to do that. So trust is something worth exploring and then assessing within our own organizations to make sure that that component is what we think it is or what we intend it to be. Now, you take a look at technology, and I think it's wonderful that DSN has a technology summit coming up later this month, and it's a full day. And I looked at the lineup of some of the, the brightest, the sharpest in that area who are going to be sharing their understanding with everyone else that tunes in that day. So uh, I hope everyone has marked the calendar. I'll certainly be listening, uh, looking myself. Now, when you think about technology, uh, there are two sides to me. One, I wouldn't want to be without my smartphone. So I respect it, but I also know I don't need to know everything about technology in order to be able to use it. I need to know enough to allow me to do what I want to do better. I go back so many years, I was an advocate of this model works when you simply talk to three people per day. And if you do that every day, five days a week, that's 15, in two it's 30, in three it's 45, in a month it's 60. You can't talk to that many people with passion and love for what you do and not experience positive results. Now, when I think about today, I can text, I can email, I can use a social platform. Three per day really doesn't make sense when maybe I could talk to 30 per day, not to mention more. But I, won't, I don't want the technology to lead me to being too commercial. I wanna be personal. And the more I can learn to express my passion, my love in whatever form of technology that I use, the better off I am because technology allows us to do more with less. And not too long ago, I was talking to a party plan group and I said, can you believe this? You know, 10, 15 years ago, you had to coach the hostess, you had to purchase it's the inventory. You had to go and do the demo. You had to entertain the people. You had to hope and sometimes pray that people would show up. And if you invited 20, you hope that 10 to 12 would show. And then after the party, you had to send the thank you notes and go back and deliver the products to the hostess who then had to deliver the products to the customers. Mm -hmm. And now, I can conduct a party, Wayne, just like we do Zoom calls, and I can have 10 or 12. There's no physical constraint. I do not have to serve refreshments. The people attending can be in close proximity, or they can be across state, in another state, or even cross country. They can be in different time zones. So technology allows us 
to do this. And our model, our channel of distribution is experiencing its best moment in the history of all moments. We've been around for a hundred and some years and it's never ever been better. It's never ever been easier. And we make it easier by embracing technology and then finding a way to make it work for us. So those are my thoughts about technology. So I don't get into specifics of this app versus that app, anything like that. I say, make sure you're using technology because you can attract people, approach people, engage people exponentially to what we ever did in the past. Does that answer that Absolutely. question? Yes, that, that was beautiful. And you said, again, uh, some very important things there. Not only does it help make things easier for the company, for the upline or trainers and the distributor level, but also for the attendees. You know, it's, it's a much easier ask to say to a friend or an associate, hey, can you jump on a Zoom, you know, for 30 minutes quick? You're not asking them to drive across town and to take an entire night to come learn about your product. So it, it almost for me, you know, being highly introverted, it's, it would be much easier for me to conduct business that way. But you're right. It, it has allowed and brought such incredible scale to the channel that it, that it really is such an incredible time to be engaged and involved in direct selling. And you also said something really important that we need to be really thoughtful in how we use the technology. We can't uh, lose that personal aspect. So we need to approach it in, in a really personal and thoughtful and meaningful way and not get kind of caught up in, in the medium, you know, where the medium kind of becomes the message. Um, I want to shift into another really interesting dynamic that your research brought out. Uh, and it's actually kind of around a gender dynamic. We all know that that women have been driving the growth of direct selling, as you mentioned, for a hundred years now. And your research has shown that that's also the same for the gig economy as well. Can you elaborate on this really cool dynamic? Yeah, it's a really cool dynamic. And when I first uh, got into the research about four years ago, the gig economy was one third women, two thirds men. By the time we finished the research, the writing and the submission of the manuscript, it had grown to 51% men, 49% women in a very short period of time, Wayne. We expect that dynamic to be on uh, the same level as direct selling. Direct selling historically has been 75% women, 25% men. So we think that trend is going to keep moving toward more women participating than men is a very fundamental reason. Women appreciate flexibility. Women appreciate freedom. Women multitask very effectively. And for the men listening, I learned after having the opportunity to work primarily with women through my uh, career at Avon Products that women think differently. And I always use this expression. I, I find a way to work it in every time I'm talking to someone like you. I grew to appreciate and become grateful of the fact that there was always a little bit of room for a few good men. And I say that sincerely. I think that we have to keep that in our thinking, in our strategies. And women, to me, are the future of this kind of work. And I just uh, think we need more women in leadership, period. That goes for everything in life, by the way. But Absolutely. this business, I think, will be about making sure that we are always offering that type of opportunity experience that is sought after and appreciated by the segment in our society that appreciates flexibility and freedom, probably more so than anyone else. You can work in the gig economy or specifically our kind of business in between family responsibilities, the care for children, the care for a parent, uh, in between doing the things that 
one does when they are responsible for the family unit. And it can all be done in between time when you have the opportunity and flexibility to do it. Customers also appreciate flexibility and they appreciate personalization. And so we have a consumer mindset now that is not looking for the physical store, but the digital platform that enables them to access the product services, things that they need in a convenient way. I don't jump in my car and run around the stores when I'm looking for something. I, I'm an Amazon Prime customer for a reason. It works and it delivers a service to me that I appreciate. So the digital platform is the new marketplace of the future. And when we can engage a digital platform and add personality, love, passion into that messaging that goes along with the product or service that is offered through the platform, we have an incredible future to look forward to. So what are a few of the things, if you had a group of CEOs in front of you right now, what are a few of the things you would recommend to them to start doing to prepare, to make sure that we in direct selling are a viable and preferred option as part of this gig economy? There are four things that I always mention, and uh, you're not the first person to ask me that question. So as I said, when I talked about the book, I consider myself a thought provoker, and that's what I attempt to do. And I do say that I think we have to think differently. Our past will not determine our future. So we have to think differently. We have to be broader. We have to embrace the fact that the marketplace has shifted and so has everything else. We perhaps, and I think we do, we have to define ourselves differently. We can't define ourselves in the same terms that we've used in the past. There's a new language. And sometimes I call my friends uh, into accountability and I, and I just say, listen to the way you're speaking because the language that you're using is not the language of the future. It's not the language of the gig economy. The gig economy talks about people as intermediaries people as influencers. Uh, we don't think about people in the gig economy as necessarily being sellers or networkers. And I'm not saying that those terms are to be explored or assessed or looked at differently, but perhaps we should look at it all a little bit differently. There are some other things that we have used as labels that I think we need to discard. So I think that we should look at how we define ourselves and perhaps we need to define ourselves differently as we think differently. Then we have to position ourselves differently. And we talked a lot about that today. What is the positioning? What is the offer? What is the value proposition for the consumer and also for the independent contractor micro entrepreneur, gig worker who chooses us to be a viable choice. And then lastly, I think we have to be willing to explore and we have to be willing to test new concepts. And every decision does not have to be absolute, but I think we have to be willing to explore. How will we learn until we test ourselves and test new ways of doing things? And you and I have been around a long time and we know that we have often attempted to motivate and inspire our people by encouraging them to shed fear. And fear is real. And fear is not only within the people, fear can be within the C-suite. Fear can be within the executive team. Fear to change is probably one of the biggest fears that we as business people have experienced because the way we got to the present is because of some past. The way we get to the future 
is not necessarily built upon everything that we gained from the past. So those are the things that I talk about, uh, Wayne. We may need to think differently. We may need to define ourselves differently. We may need to position ourselves differently. And lastly, be willing to explore new opportunities. Those are the things that I share. That's how we get to a future that's bigger, better, far more sustainable than ever before. Absolutely. And I think that's true at the company level and, and at the channel level as well. I think those are those are four great things that we need to start putting uh, into place and implementing now. John, I'm going to start wrapping up here with your amazing perspective um, from the position you've had in the channel, um, the longevity in the channel, the historical perspective you have. Looking out five years from now, where do you see the direct selling channel five years from now? More relevant. Uh, I don't know what the label will be. Direct selling is a beautiful label. Uh, that's what we do. We interact directly when we can with consumers or we make ourselves available. We interact directly with the people that we influence, be they associates, affiliates, or other direct sellers to stay with that same terminology. So we bring a lot of personalization to the equation of how we market our brands in a marketplace. We have been using intermediaries, direct sellers for many, many years to connect our products and services with consumers. I think that we just think differently about that. And uh, in five years, I don't think it's that important what the label might be. It is important that we are relevant. And I do believe that in the next five years, perhaps we are the ultimate gig. I really see that. In writing the book, I didn't want to venture and try to put a label on anyone or identify any particular thing. The topic is too broad, too rich to try to hone in on one particular thing. It's 2022. Uh, by 2027, gosh, uh, the new Amazon of our type of business will be emerging. And I don't see it as being one particular brand. I see it as being many brands that give the average person, unlike most traditional gigs, the opportunity to aggregate benefits. The benefit of being able to acquire, attract, and retain a customer who perhaps loves our products the way we do so much to the extent that they buy again and again and again. How many of those customers could we have? Is it 10? Is it 12? No, I think it's 20, 25 because I'm not putting a timeline on it. I think it's 50. I think it's 100. So when we think about five years, how many customers could we have purchasing our brand through a digital platform where we don't have to touch the product because the company is making the deliveries, doing the heavy lifting, and we are receiving the benefit. That's absolutely incredible. Now, it does mean that we think differently and we help our people think differently because the Uber driver five years from now still will have to go out and drive the car. <laughs> five years from now, why can't we be another Tide? My grandparents used Tide, Wayne. <laughs> People are still <laughs> using Tide. So five years from now, how many consumers that we have influenced might be using our product? How many intermediaries, influencers that go out and influence the acquisition and retention of other customers might be in the team of people that we have influenced, engaged, and retained as micro entrepreneurs? That's a beautiful question that you asked. What is the next five years going to look like? I think it's bigger. It is incredible what the possibilities might be. And the future will be more sustainable than ever before because in the end, it's about building brands. 
And that's what each and every one of us should be doing, building our brand through people, with people, for people. I absolutely love that. Um, not only you said it was a beautiful question. Well, that was definitely a beautiful answer. And I, I share those same sentiments as well. I think this is a really exciting time for all of us in direct selling, uh, especially after reading your book. I'm even more excited. I think that direct selling has the potential to be that ultimate gig, to command the space that it's occupied for more than you know 100 years in all of our lives. I do think it's going to come down to relevancy, as you said. It's the same for brands. It's the same for products. It's the same for companies. So I hope that that's something that we all take advantage of. I think that your book is something that needs to be read by everybody in the channel, um, especially at the executive, you know, director and up level. It paints an amazing picture of what's going on. It's important to know the playing field. And uh, there, then you can determine how to win once you know where to play, really. John, thank you again for all that you do, for all that you've done for the channel, for being such an incredible champion and mentor to all. Where can people go to purchase the book, to learn more, and to connect with you? You can purchase the book through any of your favorite bookstores. You can access any of those stores, Amazon, Barnes Noble, anybody, through our website, which is ultimategigresources.com. Now, if you go to the website, you'll see that I also make available to anyone that's interested a lot of the assets that we created when we were writing the book. So we just put that out there free. We have a couple that uh, we do charge a one-time fee. It's only $19 to access a couple of those ass assets, but most of them are out there free, including our research papers that... Uh, we have done and some of the articles that have been written about the topic. So ultimategigresources.com. Thank you, Wayne, for all of those comments about the work. And I would just say, let me say something about DSN. Uh, you know, it's in my heart, in my Please, soul. Yeah. And fortunately, I was uh, able to have that conversation with Stuart and be a part of building the brand. And what has happened today though, with Shelly uh, being the new publisher and you being uh, such an integral part of it and the team that's there, I know uh, a few of them, uh, just an incredible uh, job that you're doing. Uh, when I talked to Shelly about a year or so ago and she was talking about her vision, she said, I wanna make uh, direct selling news, a media company. And I thought about that and I said, wow, what a big, bold, bold uh, vision. It's coming true. And when I go to the website and I look at the things that you're doing and I look at the uh, various ways I can access information, I'm just so proud. I, uh, I just salute you and uh, the future looks uh, bigger, brighter, uh, far bigger than anything we envisioned. So kudos to you and the DSN team, all of you. It's a Absolutely. pleasure to be part of you. Yeah, I, I echo those same sentiments. What Shelley um, and Stuart have done with DSN is incredible. Uh, what you did um, under your leadership there is incredible. We all benefited from it. It is really the, the main source of news for the entire channel. I always look forward to to jumping on the website, to getting the printed copy. I still love thumbing through the printed copy. I even love the being on the text messages. If, if the listeners haven't done that, make yeah. sure you're getting the texts each day to stay up to speed on, on what's going on kind of moment by moment in the channel. Uh, again, John, thank you so much for being here. It's really been an honor. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you, Wayne. My best. Take care. See you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, too. All right. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you to our guest, John Fleming, for his contributions to the channel and Direct Selling News. Since 2004, DSN has proudly served the direct selling industry and the executives that lead it. Our mission is to serve, educate, and edify the channel as your go-to daily resource for breaking global news, emerging trends, and powerful stories, so you can stay informed, engaged, and always one step ahead as it relates to the business of direct selling. 
We invite you to subscribe to the podcast so that you're the first to know when new episodes are available. And don't forget to register for the upcoming Tech Summit this coming Tuesday, February 22nd. This live broadcast event is free to all active corporate direct selling executives. Register at directsellingnews.com forward slash tech summit. And we also invite you to join the new DSN VIP community that Wayne was talking about. It's a new way for direct selling executives to keep up with what's happening in the channel in real time through the convenience of text. No matter how busy you are, how many meetings you're in, you can always get an alert on your phone as far as what's happening in the channel, any breaking news that's coming, so that you are always in the know. Text the word JOIN to 214-239-3043 and follow the prompts to add DSN as a contact in your phone. It's not a separate app. It literally shows up right in your text messages. Never miss out on what's happening in the channel again. Text us at 214-239-3043. Thank you again for listening and for supporting DSN and the Direct Approach Podcast.